the tsunami of fiat money that they had been using to pump up the bubble. When Congress and the public refused to write the finance oligarchs a blank check, the bankers began to engage in financial terrorism. They said that the world would go into another Great Depression unless their demands were met, further destroying confidence. The stock market instantly had its biggest one-day loss in history, but even that wasn't enough to force Congress to capitulate to the offshore banks. Senator Inhofe of Oklahoma and Congressman Brad Sherman of California, amongst others, told the world that the entire Congress had been threatened with martial law by the White House and the Treasury Department if they didn't pass the so-called banker bailout bill. The only way they can pass this bill is by creating and sustaining a panic atmosphere. That atmosphere is not justified. Many of us were told in private conversations that if we voted against this bill on Monday, that the sky would fall, the market would drop two or 3,000 points the first day, another couple thousand the second day, and a few members were even told that there would be martial law in America if we voted no. That's what I call fear-mongering, unjustified. The final version of the bill was kept secret from the Congress until minutes before the vote on October 3, 2008. The Federal Reserve had promised total transparency, that every dime would be accounted for. To Democrats and Republicans who've opposed this plan, I say, step up to the plate. Let's do what's right for the country at this time, because the time to act is now to prevent the possibility of a crisis turning into a catastrophe. After its passage, the public learned with horror that the bill was really a financial coup d'etat by Wall Street. The bill didn't just give $700 billion to the banks. It was a blank check. And as of February 2009, $9.7 trillion has disappeared into a black hole. Within 24 hours of its passage, Secretary of Treasury Henry Paulson said they were no longer going to use the money to unfreeze the mortgage market by buying bad debt. We went to Congress, illiquid assets look like the way to go. As the situation worsened, the facts change. I will never apologize for, for changing an approach or strategy when the facts change. Paulson has in the meantime admitted that the subprime mortgage crisis is not the cause, really, of the breakdown of the entire world banking system and the bankruptcy of most of the banks in London and in, uh, in Wall Street. He said, oh, we're going to buy up toxic assets, but we're not going to worry about subprime mortgages. What he's talking about is derivatives. Derivatives are the center of the crisis. He went on to say that where the money was going was a secret. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issuance of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around the banks will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States. Secretary Paulson came in with the Vice President and uh, Fed Chairman Bernanke and made all these assurances that there was absolutely a critical, immediate need to get rid of the corrosive derivative products, you know, all the different names for this, you know, ubiquitous, you know, uh, sub S retraded credit default swap, blah, 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 blah. Okay. But they, they talked about them as though they knew what the hell they were. You got the money and you immediately said, what items, what auction? Now the Treasury just, just basically cut that out of the bill. And what, you know, what we have here is a situation where uh, banks are, are hoarding the money that they're getting from the TARP. They're using the money to purchase other banks. And all of a sudden, the Treasury sent a signal to the banks, forget about it. We're going to give you the money that you want, and you do what you want with it. Unless you direct it specifically, it's not going to happen. I don't think anyone questions, Mr. Kashkari, that you're working hard 
Our question is who you're working for. Throughout its passage, President Bush and Senator Obama worked in tandem to get Congress to pass the bill without even having time to read it, despite the fact that in major polls, 98% of the American people were against the bill. The leadership in both parties were for it. And I really want to commend Barack Obama because as we were involved in the this and that and different provisions of the bill to persuade people, he really gave them confidence that this was the right decision uh, for the American people, even though it wasn't, in our view, a great bill uh, for them to vote on. I want to take a particular moment to also thank the individual who's not here, and that is Barack Obama, who made numerous calls not only to all of us, but to members of our caucus and helped us gather the votes on the Democratic side to pass this legislation. Bank heads then bragged to the press that they were hoarding the bailout money and using it to buy up smaller, healthy banks and insurance companies. Their plan was working like a charm. Next, the central bankers loaned the federal government back $787 billion of our own money at interest for President Obama's so-called stimulus package. And just like the banker bailout, Congress was given less than an hour to read the 1,070-page-plus stimulus bill. Barack Obama, who had pledged on the campaign trail to wait five days before a bill could be voted on so that the Congress and the people could have a chance to read it, said that the stimulus was too important and it had to be passed before anybody could see it or read it, or the crisis would turn into a catastrophe. Doing little or nothing at all will result in either, even greater deficits, even greater job loss, even greater loss of income, and even greater loss of confidence. Those are deficits that could turn a crisis into a catastrophe, and I refuse to let that happen. After its Friday passage, in gangster fashion, President Barack Obama took a four-day vacation and said that there was no rush to sign it. The spending bill was really a takeover bill designed to further federalize the states and to pay off rich donors that had donated to both parties. As the world slid deeper into depression, the bankers celebrated the fire sale that they had created. I believe this, the phrase, burdens of the office, is overstated. Yeah, it's kind of like, why me? Oh, the burdens, you know. Why did the financial collapse have to happen on my watch? It's just pathetic, isn't it? Self-pity. And I, and I don't believe uh, a president-elect Obama will be full of self-pity. With their access to unlimited fiat capital, they could now buy up sectors of the world economy not already controlled by them. For over a century, the Anglo-American establishment had worked to bring the world system to this point. Artificially engineered global bankruptcy. In an address before the Trilateral Commission in June of 1991, David Rockefeller laid out the elite's ultimate goal the supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in the last centuries. Now that the bankers were holding the world hostage, they issued their ultimatum. The only solution to restart the global economy would be to set up a planetary government ruled by a new bank